Good morning. As I told you before, my name is Tim Grinke, and I'm representing the state in this case. Uh, sitting with me at council table is Assistant District Attorney Susan Donsky, as well as Captain John Zimmerman from La Crosse County Sheriff's Department. Um, he will be testifying a number of times throughout the case. And I realize that as I stand here, I have a difficult job. I need to convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant in this case killed his wife of 25 years, Barbara Kenthammer. Um, I understand the burden that I have, and I, I accept the burden gladly. That's my job, and that's what I do. This is a sensitive case. This is a very serious case. There's going to be a lot of emotion in this case. And I will do my best to treat everybody with dignity and respect as we go through the facts of this case. We're here to seek the truth of what happened to Barbara Kenthammer. At the end of the case, I'm arguing that the truth does not support the version that Todd Kenhammer gave to police and does support a conviction for first-degree intentional homicide. On Friday, September 16th, 2016, a little over a year ago, Todd Kenhammer, who was the defendant in this case, called 911 at about 8 in the morning. He reported a traffic accident involving his wife, Barbara Kenhammer, indicating that a pipe or something came through the window and had struck her. He indicated that a truck was coming towards him in the opposite direction that he was traveling. The pipe came off the truck, flew through the windshield, and hit Barbara somewhere on the neck or chest or head. When he called 911, he had gotten her out of the car and was performing CPR. He said he was trained on that at work. Unfortunately, Barbara would pass away from the injuries that she suffered. What started out looking like a tragic car accident would soon become much more complicated because of the stories that Todd told and the police tried to figure out what really happened. To orient you a little bit, this is exhibit number two eventually during the trial. This is a map that shows you is on East Scotch Cooley Road, and at the south end of the map is West Salem. Uh, marked on the map is West Salem Middle School, which is where Barbara was scheduled to work that Friday morning. And then also marked on the map is Bergen Cooley Road, which you visited this morning, north of West Salem, just off Highway M, where the car ended up. Now, if you look at the screen, uh, the picture that's there is from a drone, and the picture is from above Bergen Cooley Road facing west towards the river. Uh, Highway M would be towards the top of that screen running from the left to the right. And the car would have ended up somewhere near the bottom of that road. So that's the area <coughs> that we're talking about. This would be another drone photo from the south looking north, or a little bit northwest actually on Highway M. To the right of that T intersection would be Bergen Cooley Road. Uh, towards the bottom of the photograph on the center left is the mailbox where there was an orange cone marked this morning where Todd indicated to a police officer that's about where this pipe hit his car as he was traveling north. This truck was coming south towards West Salem. He continued about another 100 yards to that intersection, turned right, and then continued about another 100 yards on Burden Cooley Road where he ended up backwards into the ditch. This is the car as it was that day. Uh, you can see it's about 8 in the morning. It was light out. Uh, the roads were a little wet. It was a slight rain or misty rain, but not a full-on rain. Towards the top of the screen, you would see Highway M in the distance there. And the car is backwards in a ditch. Uh, the right passenger door was open. Um, you can see that the grass and the vegetation towards the back of the car was, was tall. Uh, I'm calling it a ditch. It, there's a drop-off there, and it's a sudden drop-off, so it's not a gradual rolling down. It's, it's kind of a sudden drop-off, so the bottom of the car is almost resting on the dirt. You can see that was a grassy area, not a sandy or dirty area. Um, this is more of you from the front of the car. You can see damage to the windshield. It uh, looks like a couple of cracks to the windshield, and you can see the driver's side down in the ditch. And that was a view from the driver's side of the car, partially on the road. 
and the back wheel down the driver's side window was down. At the back of the car, the police took some photographs because they noted some things that they would just note in any accident. At this time, they're responding to a traffic accident. They don't know exactly what happened. There could be drugs or alcohol involved. There could be texting while driving. There could be other drivers. So they just start documenting everything they might see. This is an area near the back uh, passenger side tire. So it was down in the ditch. And there's blood on the grass um, that you can see in the photograph. And there's also a, a mark on the tire and a small amount of blood on the rim of that tire. And the police documented that. This photograph is just a little bit in front of that spot where there's some more blood seen in the, the swamp grass. The police took close-up photographs. There looked like some blood droplets on the rim of the tire. And also another spot that looked like uh, some blood rubbed up against or something transferred blood to the, again, rear passenger tire. The police then photographed the inside of the car, and this would have been the passenger seat um, where Barbara would have been sitting. There was glass on the seat. Her right shoe was found inside the car. There is some blood on the console, and there's a white piece of paper with some blood on it. That's an envelope. There's also some glass that you can see on the gear shifter area and on the front seat of the car. The police noticed that in the back seat of the car, the back passenger side, was Barbara's purse. Inside was her identification and her wallet, as well as her cell phone, it appeared to be sitting right on top of the purse in the back seat of the car. It was upright like that when the police found it. On the driver's side, the police noted that there was a, a travel mug. You're going to hear it called a couple different things, a big bubba cup, travel mug, travel cup. Um, but it's a, it's a travel mug. Uh, put water in it to take in a car with you. There's a top on it that closes so it doesn't leak. It was on the driver's side floor facing the top towards the seat. So the bottom is facing in the picture as you see it. There was also right, uh, I'll use my laser pointer, right there there's a small piece of blue plastic that appeared to have broken off from the top of that mug. Going back to the passenger side, the police noted that on the seat and in the area between the seat and the door, there was a large amount of dirt, a sand dirt deposited. The rest of the car was clean, so this was out of place. And the dirt um, did not seem to fit with what was in the terrain. There was grass and swamp, so they photographed this dirt on the seat. The windshield did have, looked like two places where there was some impact. Uh, in the center of the screen, there is a hole in the windshield. You can see what looks to be blood on the outside of the windshield around that hole. There are also some shards of glass towards the right that also appears to be uh, covered with blood. At the very top of the picture is an impact that is bulging outwards. It appears that something struck the windshield from the inside of the vehicle. That pipe was found um, in the grass behind the car, about 10 feet behind the car. Um, the defendant had indicated that he threw it there after he took it out of the car after this incident. So police photographed that and noted its location and how it looked at the scene. a drone pick again that the police went later to the scene and photographed where the objects were found. The car outlined uh, the pipe uh, where it was found. Also behind the car is marked where the defendant's cell phone was found that day and also where Barb's left shoe was found uh, after police had noticed um, after a while it was in tall grass a little ways away from the car in the grass. Police noted that when they took the pipe 
into evidence. They could not see any obvious um, blood on it. But continuing to investigate what happened, they just started asking questions of the defendant being the only witness, what exactly happened. Um, this is a picture of the pipe that was taken inside at the sheriff's apartment that day. And one end will have some dirt on it towards the right. And on the left, uh, we're calling it a knuckle, a nut. Uh, there's a end screwed onto that pipe. Um, so one pipe has a different side than the other end of the pipe. At the scene, uh, Todd indicated that he had some injuries to his hands, and the police photographed that, and they saw blood to almost all the knuckles on his left hand and some blood on the knuckles on his right hand. Um, the police asked him how he got those injuries. He indicated that when he saw the pipe traveling towards him in the air, he reached out to try to grab it or stop it or catch it, impact it in some way. And while he was driving, he took his hands off the wheel and lunged forward and hit the windshield with both fists. And he said that's what caused the bulge that you saw at the scene, was his fists impacting the windshield, punching it out, and leaving those marks on his hand. The police also noted that he had scratches on the right side of his neck uh, this photo was taken the same day, but at the hospital where he had been transported. Um, they also noticed scratches on the left side of his neck. When he was asked that day how he got those scratches, he indicated that he works with glass. Um, he would later say at a different interview that he didn't know how exactly he got those scratches. While the defendant was being transported to the hospital, Sergeant Mark Yealy of the La Crosse County Sheriff's Department transported him and started asking questions, and you'll hear that recording. At this point, uh, the conversation was a little bit of small talk, a little bit about explaining to Todd where they're going, and also just getting some basic information about what happened so the police could continue their investigation. Uh, Mr. Kinhammer indicated that he and Barbara left their house that morning between 7.30 and 7.45. She was supposed to be at work that day. He did not have work until later that night. He said they were going north, away from her workplace, because they were going north to Holman to pick up a truck so that he could put a windshield in the truck. Putting windshields in vehicles is a side job that he has, and he was going to go to the residence of a person named Justin Heim, who he works with, pick up the truck, take it to his house and work on it, Barbara would then take the car, and she would go to work. He said that she did not have to work until about 8.30, and she could call if she was going to be late, so that's why they were traveling north, away from her workplace. He indicated that as he was driving north, away from West Salem, another truck was heading south, and he saw something come off the truck and fly towards them. He realized it was a pipe. A pipe. Uh, he described it as a three-quarter ton truck, a makeshift steel flatbed on it. It had 18-inch, two-foot high metal sides in the truck. He thought it was around a 2000 model but was unable to describe who might be the manufacturer, Chevy, Ford, or so on. He said it was dark in color, wasn't sure about the color, could be dark green, dark blue, even black. He indicated uh, to Sergeant Ealy that it was just south of Bourbon Cooley, near that mailbox where this happened, where the pipe came through the windshield. Uh, he said it came straight off the back of the truck, didn't strike the ground, and passed through the windshield, hitting his wife and causing her injuries. He said he did not break, um, didn't lose control of the car, just used his hands to hit the windshield and try to stop the pipe. Turned on the Bergen Cooley Road, tried to get the pipe out of the windshield somehow, and ended up somehow hitting the car in reverse, and that's how the car ended up in the ditch. He said that nobody would stop to help him. Uh, he said he did not call 911 right away because he knew he had to get her out of the car and perform CPR. So it was a few minutes before he called 911. <coughs> he said that in Holman, the truck belonging to Justin Heim should be parked at the end of the driveway, and the keys would be in it so he could just stop by and pick it up. He also said he attempted to pick up the same vehicle the night before, which had been Thursday night the 15th, but was unable to locate it. Police then that day started looking for the truck. They canvassed the neighborhood, asking if anybody saw anything. And these days, they start looking 
for surveillance videos. They know places that have surveillance videos and they know pretty much where to go. So they started looking for anywhere along the highway or in West Salem where the truck was headed might have a video of the truck with the flatbed so that they could interview that person. surveillance video at a number of places towards the very bottom. Um, they did get video from Quick Trip, which always has very good video. Unfortunately, it didn't show much of the highway, but it would show the entire parking lot of Quick Trip if anybody would stop there, which is a popular place where people stop when they go to West Salem. Uh, they found a first responder station on Brickell Road that had video. Um, they also found Union Bank which is at the intersection of M and 16, which is a very popular intersection in West Salem, kind of a main point to get to if you're going to go anywhere in West Salem. The bank video showed the best view of the intersection, a clear video of that intersection, and they were unable to locate any vehicles between, they look 7.30 to 8.30, of any truck matching a description. They also found towards the top of the map um, there's a horse farm called Wild Wings Ranch that has a video that shows the highway barely. It's not meant to show the highway, it's meant to show the driveway and the property, but you can see the highway in the distance. And looking at that, they knew that the truck, if it were going south, would have passed there about a minute after Burton Cooley Road. It's not that far from Burton Cooley Road. At 7.57 on that video, they see a vehicle that looks like the Ken Hammer's car traveling north. About 10 seconds later, there's a pickup truck that passes south, not something with makeshift flatbed or rails. And then later on, a truck goes north. Um, later on, there's some more vehicles that go south. There's a van, there's a car, but there's nothing that looks like it would be a flatbed or have rails on it. So they didn't find any vehicle matching. They did put out a press release. The Sheriff's Department used their press release information, they used Facebook, they tried to reach the community and ask if anybody saw anybody driving to stay, anything uh, out of place. They reached out for witnesses and they've never been able to locate a truck that matched the description given by Mr. Ken Hammer. The next thing that they did is going to be a little bit unnerving to some people because on your phone, if you use Google Maps, um, the phone tracks where you go. And you can actually look at your phone yourself to see that. But police can send a subpoena to Google and get what they call a Google Dashboard, which basically shows where your phone has been over a certain period of time. In doing that, the Sheriff's Department was able to realize that Todd Kenhammer's phone on the 16th, the wrong button, started out here in this cluster which is the Ken Hammer residence on East Scotch Cooley Road, right off of 108, uh, right off East Scotch Cooley. So in the morning, his phone was at his residence. At about 7.49, 7.48, time like this, it goes this way to the next door neighbor, which is the Barbara Thompson residence. Police were able to determine that Barbara Thompson is living out of town. They believe Todd Ken Hammer was taking care of the residence, but Mr. Ken Hammer never mentioned going that direction, but for some period of time, a couple of minutes, his phone was there. The number that's in parentheses is the accuracy within meters. So that's why some are more accurate than others. The phone looked like it then went west and then south, continued south at around 750 to 752. It then went across a road called Asmus Road, which hooks up with Highway M and then goes north. At 757, it's at this corner of Erickson Road and Lehman Road. We'll later just discover that that's exactly where the Wild Wings Ranch is, where the video shows a car matching them at 737, so we think it's all pretty accurate. It's then heading north towards Bergen Cooley Road at about 759, and then that's where the car was found and the phone was there for a period of time, obviously. Um, I'll tell you that Barbara's phone pretty much matches that. Um, Barbara did not make any uh, calls that morning. Uh, she did receive some calls, but her phone 
also matches that path that shows that they were traveling north at about 8 uh, near Burton Cooley Road. Um, at this point, the police are still investigating a traffic accident. They're looking for this other truck. They're also trying to find out um, what makes sense about Todd's story. And Barbara had an autopsy done by Dr. McCubbin of the Dane County Medical Examiner's Office, and she found a number of injuries that were not consistent with a pipe of this size flying through the window and impaling her. The pipe is 53 inches long. It weighs about 10 pounds. It's made out of steel. for things that happened during the CPR and life-saving process for Barbara, and she accounts for the bruises and marks on her body that were not caused by somebody else, but caused by either CPR being done or some other life-saving measure. So we will show you and explain that she can account for those injuries. She had a number of injuries to her hands. Um, she had bruises um, on her hands. She had debris under her nails. Uh, she had some torn fingernails. Uh, a DNA exam would later show that the defendant's DNA were under Barbara's fingernails. Um, she also had injuries to her fingers that would look like scrapes or abrasions, and she had bruises to her hands um, that would cover almost the entire side of a hand. photos of some of those pictures later on. This is um, exhibit number eight later on. The most serious injuries were to her head. Um, Dr. McCubbin will tell you on the back of Barbara's head, she had what she'll call lacerations. They're significant lacerations. Uh, they're extremely deep cuts, long cuts, and underneath the one on the left, there's skull fractures. Um, on the left side of her head, she had a laceration with skull fracture underneath it. On the right side, she had two lacerations, um, so all that on the back of her head. Her eyes were black and blue because she had broken nose. There was nothing in the outside to indicate a pipe hitting her or a cut or anything like that, but her nose was broken. She had a laceration on her forehead. Her lips were bruised on the inside. Her teeth were not damaged, but the inside of her lips had bruising on them, which would be consistent with somebody holding them down, pressing against the teeth. Her neck had a number of abrasions or scratches on them, which looked like something rubbing up against it, consistent with a fingernail or something like a fingernail that would be scratching at a person's neck, but not consistent with a, a pipe. Her cheeks had some scratches on the right and left side. She had various bruises around her face and on different parts of her head. At this point, Dr. McCubbin was indicating what she did not see was anything that would be consistent with this pipe flying at high speed coming through windshield and paling her. No circular mark nothing that would be the force that that would in indicate. Um, the injuries in the back of her head could not happen at the same time. 
can't hit one part of your head and have injuries on other parts. And she also will say that given the different sides of the head that had injuries and different types of injuries, it could not come from a pipe coming through a windshield. The vehicle was sent to the crime lab to see if there's any forensic help that might explain what happened as well. And this is a photograph of the windshield from up above, and it shows the uh, cracks in the windshield. Oh, sorry. Um, the crime lab will testify by the name of uh, Nick Stalkey. Here and what Nick Stalky will testify to is that he saw at least four separate impact points on the windshield. Uh, in the middle of the windshield, there are two separate points, one marked with the A in the orange and B in the green. The A would happen first, and then section B. Because of the line that separates, <coughs> you could say that those cracks happen first, and then these cracks, because they end at that line, happen second. This would be bulging outward, the point where Todd can't have said he hit his fist. It's located underneath the rear view mirror um, in a high on the windshield. Nick Salvi will tell you that he then sees an impact point here, which is yellow, and he sees radiating spider web from that point, and then the last impact point is where the payback is penetrated and left that flap of glass. Because of where the cracks end, you can tell which came first and which came second. And because there's two impact points here, he said there was more than one impact strike with the pipe. <coughs> and this is a close-up version of the same cracks. Later on, this shows the flap closed and the red staining appeared to be blood. The first impact pattern happening here radiates all the way through the flap when it's closed, indicating this happened, made those lines, and then the impact there was the final impact. The crime lab also looked at the entire car, and in the trunk, they found in the lower right part of the screen, uh, you can see a piece of grass that was caught in the lip of the trunk, indicating that somebody closed the trunk on a piece of grass. Um, inside the trunk, there was also some, looked like soil or rust that might have been left behind. This impact point is, again, a close-up of the center strike. That's one impact point in the upper left, and then another one further down, at least two impact points. This is another close-up photo that shows this line came from the center impact points and the line stop, indicating that the first hit happened before the second. And again, with the flap closed, See the lines go through the flap, indicating this strike happened before the final strike. There was blood spatter inside the vehicle. There was what appeared to be on the left side of that rear view mirror. You can kind of make out what appeared to be a fingerprint of blood. It was not sufficient enough to test to see whose fingerprint it was, but it looked like a smudge of blood on the rear, uh, rear view mirror. The blood inside the car. Um, indicated that these drops of blood, Nick Stalky will tell you as a blood spatter expert, come from somebody applying force to something inside the vehicle that is a source of blood, as opposed to what's called cast off or flailing around. When you have blood on your hands and swing your hands, the cast off would have elongated lines of blood as opposed to these 
drops that are formed when something's hit and then blood just kind of spatters and lands on the surfaces. He can tell which comes from some force and which comes from what's called cast off or flailing around. Um, inside the passenger door, you're looking straight down. This is a map pocket inside the uh, front passenger's door. There was no glass or dirt in the passenger door as there was in the seat that was had dirt and glass. And Nick Stalke's opinion will be to you that the door was open when the pipe came through the window. The pipe deposited the dirt and the glass in the seat when nobody was sitting there. The door was open, so no glass and no dirt deposited in the door map pocket. The seat belt had heavy blood staining on it. Uh, there was no blood seen on the headrest or the back of the seat. Um, there was also the blood on the console and on the envelope, which Nick Salky will explain to you. You can tell where people are bleeding and how the blood is getting there from how the blood drops look. Um, it did not look like a situation where somebody was bleeding from the head, leaning back against the headrest, but there was a lot of blood in the seat belt on the console, and there was also blood on the floor mat. This is pictures taken with luminol, which the blue is what lights up as blood when you spray luminol on a surface and then take a picture. And both of them show, again, staining on the console in the middle of your pictures and the seat belt, but not blood on a headrest or the back of the seat, which would be inconsistent with blows to the back of the head happening first. At this point, the police decided they need to do some more investigating. Uh, the medical examiner and the crime lab are saying there are things that don't add up here. It doesn't quite look like a pipe through a windshield with just one strike. Uh, so they started investigating Mr. Ken Hammer's statement that he gave to Sergeant Ailey. They talked to Justin Hine, who does live in Holman. He works at Crown Cork and Seal at the same place that the defendant works, but they work different shifts. They know each other, they see each other at work, but not often they don't work together. Um, Justin Heim stated that on September 16th, he did not need a windshield from Todd Canhammer. None of his vehicles needed a windshield. He was not home at the time. He was on vacation. He did not get any calls from Todd Canhammer. He was not expecting him at his residence. He doesn't believe Todd had ever been to his house. And he did not have any arrangement to have his keys left in the truck at the end of the driveway for Todd to pick up. He did indicate that he talked to Todd Canhammer in the spring of 2016 about a friend maybe needing a windshield, and he knew that Todd did this on the side. The friend's name is Ben Paff. To be sure, the police went and talked to Ben Paff to see if maybe that's who the defendant was going to see on September 16th. Mr. Paff said he never wanted a windshield. He's got a farm truck that Justin thought might need to be replaced with a windshield, but Ben said he doesn't know Mr. Ken Hammer, never talked to him, never met with him, didn't have any arrangement to pick up any pickup truck. So the police now discover that they're not sure where he was going that morning because where he said he was going doesn't seem to add up. They also check with uh, Barbara's work, the West Salem Middle School. She worked in the kitchen. She was scheduled to work that Friday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, she had always been scheduled to work at 8. She was not allowed to come in late, reflect her hours. Uh, her work records show that she was always at work right about 8 o'clock. And whenever she was going to be late, she would always call. There were no calls at school that morning. In fact, a member of the school called her at 8.02 when she didn't show up because she was expected at 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, uh, the 911 call, the phone records, everything shows that the Kinhammers were heading north by Burden Cooley Road, a ways away from the middle school. Barbara also called her mother, Joyce Adams, who lives next door to the Kinhammers. She used to call her every morning between 7.40, 7.45 on her way to work. And it looked like she would call and stay on the phone for the whole trip because all the calls are about eight to ten minutes. Um, on this Friday, she did not call her mother at around that time. Her phone wasn't even within reach. It would have been in the back seat. The police then talked to Mr. Kanehammer again to confront him about some of these incidents and ask him why his explanation doesn't make sense. Um, Mr. Kanehammer still stated a number of times that he was still going to Justin Heim's house, but he didn't call ahead. He said he went there the night before looking for the truck as well, but the person wasn't home. He was going to go look for the truck before Barb had to go to work. She did not call ahead. He said he knew that Justin kept his truck and keys at the end of the driveway, 
but then he said he wasn't going to his house. The police and Mr. Cannon will go back and forth a lot on exactly where he was going, and it, it does not make sense. And the police are trying to figure out why he would be saying he was driving around looking for a truck when there's no arrangement to pick up a truck. He agreed that the injuries to Barbara didn't make sense with a pipe going 100 miles an hour. If both vehicles are traveling 50 going the opposite way, a pipe coming off will be going with a force of 100 miles an hour. But he couldn't explain the injuries except maybe she was flailing around in the car. He couldn't really explain where the injuries from his neck came from. Uh, he was sure that by going to work late, if she wasn't there by 8.30, she could call in and she could flex her time if she wanted to. Um, he was vague about the injuries and how it happened, where the pipe hit her. He was vague about taking her out of the car. He did say a few times that he didn't take her out too nice. And he wasn't sure how the blood got on her rear tire if her head was up at the road when the first responders responded to do CPR on the road. He denied there were any arguments. Uh, he didn't say that he had any blackouts, no drinking or drugs involved, no memory problems, um, nothing else. The police also canvassed the neighborhood then, looking for any witnesses that might have come across the car, seen the car, seen something happen, and they found a man named Randy Erler. Randy Erler is a drywaller, and he was going to a residence on Bergen Cooley Road, and he was supposed to be there by 8. He was running a little bit behind. At around 8, he was on Bergen Cooley Road. He knows that because he got to the house he was supposed to be at on Bergen Cooley at either 8.02 or 8.04, according to his truck clock. He said that when he drove by, he thought either a, a drunk got stuck or a kid in the neighborhood tried to do a turn and got stuck, got out and went to get their parents or something. And the reason he thought that is that as he drove by, he was seeing this view and he saw the truck or car in the ditch. He saw that the window was down. He did not see any people. He did not see any people. He did not hear any people calling for help. And he did not see anything wrong with the windshield. He said he could see through the windshield because he could see there was no people sitting in it. He could see through the windshield because he could see that the passenger door was slightly open. He slowed down because he didn't want to hit anybody running out. And he said if he had seen the cracks, he would have stopped for help. But when he went by, the windshield was fine. There was no pipe. There were no people. He assumed it was either a drunk or a kid that got stuck and kept on going to his job. DNA was done, and the analysis of the car showed that there was a mixture of Todd and Barb's DNA on the outside of the windshield underneath the flat. The DNA of Barbara was found in the back tire where the blood was found in the tire. There was no blood found on either end of the pipe that was tested. And there was DNA of Todd Kenhammer underneath Barb's fingers. Now, I won't pretend to you that I know everything that happened that day because I wasn't there. Barb, unfortunately, has passed away. And the only person that can tell us what happened is telling a story that is not true. You won't hear any evidence that Todd and Barbara were fighting. They were married for 25 years. They had two children. They had a grandchild. Many people say that they seem to be a good couple, a happy couple, a normal couple. There won't be any testimony or witness to some sort of argument or history of violent behavior. But in the end, you will be convinced that there was no truck. There was no truck that lost a pipe. The pipe did not fly and crashed the windshield. Todd did not hit the windshield before the pipe hit his fists. And once you understand that the only reality left is an unfortunate one that nobody wants to face and no one wants to admit, but we have to find the truth for Barb. And at the end of the case, I'll ask you to enter a conviction of guilty for first-degree intentional homicide for Todd Kenhammer.